Hello everyone, I know that I don't usually do response videos, but I figured I'd shed some light on this guy, Matt Powell. He's been talking to various skeptics recently, including myself, link in the description below, so I wanted to see if anything I said rubbed off on him. And so forth, and just prove as a young college student that the Bible is true, and that the evolutionary theory is a fraud, and in fact it's a religion, and it's a lie straight from hell. No, apparently not. Alright, let's jump right in. Matt's videos are pretty short, so I'll take them two at a time. The first two are titled Dinosaurs in the Bible and Carbon Dating Debunked. Okay, let's get to the first one. The Bible says in Job 41 verse 15, His scales are his pride, describing a dinosaur, shut up together as with a closed seal. And most people stop there and say, well, see, that's not a dinosaur. They didn't really see the dinosaurs because we didn't dig up the dinosaur fossils till recently because they're millions and millions of years extinct. The first issue here is the passage itself. Even if we just pretend we can take this one quote completely out of context without any reference to the rest of the material in the chapter, then it still doesn't sound like a dinosaur. It could be describing literally any reptile or most fish. When we put it back into context though, we see that God is bragging about how powerful he is, being able to defeat the sea monster called Leviathan. I'm not going to delve into the history of this thing and why it's not some prehistoric creature, since Trey the Explainer already did it in a video titled, What is the Leviathan? and What can it tell us about ancient religions? You should definitely check it out because it's awesome. The tale traces back deep in Eurasian religions. The short version is that the Leviathan isn't described as a plesiosaur, mosasaur, or whatever, but rather a giant serpent, usually with lots of snaky heads, like the Hydra a feature unknown among any actual vertebrates. Even if we do believe that they did see some animal we've previously considered long extinct, it wouldn't be a dinosaur because dinosaurs don't live in the water. Also, just because we've only found evidence indicating the non-avian dinosaurs have long been extinct, that doesn't mean there couldn't be any out there under our noses right now. It's just unlikely since there's no evidence of any non-avian dinosaurs surviving the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. Well, what I think is so silly about that is the Bible says in verse 19, it says, Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Wait, what? So literally, whatever this creature was, the people of Israel, the people of God, everybody in the whole world knew what these creatures were. Everyone knew what dragons were? Then why do cultures vary so drastically in their depiction of dragons? Why are some more like snakes, others like lions, and yet others like the normal hexapod reptile? Maybe people invented similar legends about these creatures because large reptiles, such as alligators, crocodiles, snakes, and iguanas, are abundant and scary. Now, if they were billions of years gone, if they were millions of years extinct, then that wouldn't make any sense. What wouldn't make any sense? That people invented legends about dragons? How is that dependent on when dinosaurs died? And it's very clear that we made a recent discovery, scientists, paleontologists, in fact, made a recent discovery of dinosaur fossils that were not completely fossilized all throughout, which means that these would have had to die recent in history. Who did? Citation, please. Because if something's millions and millions of years old, obviously it's going to fossilize quicker and it's going to become rock, it's going to become hard, and it's eventually going to just decay. These dinosaurs that they discovered died recent in history. Not necessarily. Remember we talked about how small bits of soft tissue can remain preserved over long periods of time if they're insulated extremely well. Oh, yes, the soft tissue. So actually, it, when you, you should read her research, it's very intriguing. Sure. Um, what you'll find is that these, these tiny, teeny tiny bits of soft tissue are, are found when they're preserved in basically areas where they're not exposed to like open air, they're not exposed to microbes, and so when they're in these tiny pockets, where you know temperature is not affecting them or soil acidity or anything like that, the the question basically becomes why should we expect them to break down? 
Matt then proceeds to quote another verse about how the Leviathan breathes fire and concludes with this. The Bible says, His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. So notice the wording. It says a flame literally goes out of his mouth. And so with this discovery that we've recently made, these dinosaurs, they have chambers in the back of their head to where they can breathe out fire. No, 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 no. This claim comes straight from the pit of Dwayne Gish in the 1990s and conflicts with everything we know from paleontology, which makes sense because Gish had no background in paleontology. Yes, Gish believed based on exactly zero evidence that the crest of Parasaurolophus held flammable chemicals that allowed it to breathe fire. Gish neglected to mention how the physics of that worked, not that he cared about data anyway, so someone repeating this absolutely absurd claim today, when refutations of it have been available for some 26 years, is beyond poor scholarship. We can then skip a bit because he's just reviewing his alleged arguments. A recent discovery that's been made is there's been fossilized seashells that are up on top of Mount Everest, which means that Mount Everest would have had to have been covered with water at some point, which again proves a, a global flood. No, what it proves is that lighter rock is pushed up during orogenic events as continents collide. I plan on doing a whole video on this process in the future, but the short version is that the mountaintop shells are benthic creatures from the deep ocean. So either there is a method we've already discovered by which fossilized deep sea organisms can be pushed up to the surface, or a global flood occurred in the past that somehow managed to spit up just those critters and turn it all into rock without killing every living aquatic creature, defying a number of laws of physics, and otherwise leaving no other evidence behind. I'll let you decide which happened. So to say, well, you know, there was no global flood, there was no, you know, time where God had to wipe out the earth is just ridiculous and illogical based on the scientific discoveries that we've made. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. And that's really the end of this video, so let's move on to the second, titled Carbon Dating Debunked, featuring Chris Gillum. Let's hope he's not as superficial in his scholarship as the previous video. Hi ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris Gillum, I'm with uh, Way of Truth, and I'm 21 years old, and I believe that the Earth is no more than 6,500 years old, approximately 6,000 years old, and a lot of people my age get attacked for having that belief and say, well, don't you read the science books? And Well, when it comes to being changed every semester, it's kind of hard to follow a book. I choose to follow a book that's hundreds of years old. I don't think you actually read any textbooks, since the underlying concepts conveyed in them aren't changed from semester to semester. How the four basic forces work isn't constantly under revision, nor is how radioisotopes decay. And are you saying you trust a book just because it's old? The Epic of Gilgamesh is older than the Bible, so is it truer? It's never changed. It's they called the King James Bible. It was printed in 1611. And you know, the Bible tells us that there's going to be people who profess themselves to be wise, but they became fools, and they also and that they would come in the name of science, falsely so called. The Bible says in first Timothy chapter six in verse twenty, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoid profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science, falsely so called. You know, people like to always say, Well we've got carbon fourteen dating that proves that the earth is billions of years old. No, that's not what Carbon-14 says. Nobody who understands how Carbon-14 dating works thinks it proves the Earth is billions of years old. Steve McRae derived in the comments section that it's only useful up to a few tens of thousands of years. And Gillum even provided a link to an Answers in Genesis article on Carbon-14 dating that says it's only useful to a few thousands of years. Even though the article is wrong in many respects, it's right on this. Did Gillum find the article after he made a video about the topic? Did he just wing it, thinking he knew much of anything about carbon dating? And, you know, carbon-14 dating has been debunked and disproved because everybody always assumes that if you take a chunk of pure material, it has X amount of carbon in it. Well, it seems to me that you're starting off with a false positive because you believe that this chunk of, say, this Bible is made out of pure lead. You're saying that this Bible or that this chunk of lead has this much lead in it, but you don't know if it's contaminated with other materials, and if it is, that completely throws off your measurement. Let's address that first part about assuming the amount of radiocarbon in a sample. 
Gillum is evidently unaware that the amount can be measured directly using accelerator mass spectrometry, so that's one thing he's wrong about. Next, contamination is always taken into account during carbon dating. Every radiometric dating technique takes note of way more than that. Carbon isotope balances are affected by radiation, our burning of fossil fuels, microscopic bacterial intrusions, and even how the two photosynthetic carbon fixation reactions prefer the lighter, natural carbon-12 atom. It's only a creationist misconception that scientists just cavalierly assume there has been no contamination. Now, for this next part, ignore Gillum. Pay attention to the cartoon. Could have been contaminated in other areas. I would consider that a vain babbling because it's constantly changing. Okay, did you see that the cartoon person said he carbon dated a living organism? This is a blatant misapplication of carbon dating. The method only works for things that have been dead for at least a hundred years, so of course carbon dating living things is going to give you the wrong answer. This video just continues to solidify that neither Gillum nor Powell have any understanding of carbon dating. I would consider that a vain babbling because it's constantly changing. If we could tell the first time how old the Earth is with carbon-14 dating, why are we now up to 5.4 billion years when we start off with oh, just a couple million years? Well, that's because they keep having to change it because they keep discovering more and more things that are like, well, you know, maybe if we put enough time in there, we can justify macroevolution with microevolution. No, our understanding of the Earth's age has changed historically because new methods of dating objects, none of which are carbon dating, became available. Potassium argon, rubidium strontium, and uranium lead dating all independently indicate that the Earth is at least millions of years old. And what does this have to do with macroevolution? The conversation was how we know the age of the Earth, which only deals with evolution secondarily. And that's not the case. The only way they can do that is by saying the Earth is billions of years old. Because they say, well, we all came from a single, single celled amoeba, and now we're all here. We, but that still doesn't explain why we're here or how we got here. If we have come up with a demonstrably true explanation of how we evolved, then the question of how we got here is solved. Why we are here is a different question with potentially no answer. Say if you were to go out and find a, a piece of raw material like lead, and you are going to say, I'm going to carbon-14 date this. Well, you're going to have to uh, make some assumption or use your own rules that you make up to try to guess how much carbon was in that piece of material from its origin. And that's not necessarily that accurate because it could be contaminated from the beginning of its life. It could have been contaminated with other materials, which would therefore throw off the carbon-14 dating. But people are still justifying it and using it as a crutch, trying to justify their dead evolutionary beliefs. And I agree that the answer is probably going to be inaccurate, especially since you're attempting to date, of all things, lead. Literally, the first fact you need to understand to carbon date something is that the object you're dating contains organic material. I have a hard time thinking of anything more inorganic than lead. How do you think carbon-14 would get into the lead? More importantly, how do you think carbon-14 gets into anything? To be honest, I'm not sure you do think about it. Gillum has so absolutely failed here to demonstrate even a high school understanding of carbon dating that it's laughable he was the one chosen to represent a rational opposition to it. I don't even care about the rest of Gillum's video because he just spouts some presuppositional nonsense that's totally irrelevant to science, not that he has any concept of the science he's trying to present. So let's recap. Matt's first video was just a regurgitation of old, debunked creationist arguments, and the second was a total failure to comprehend what carbon dating is and how it works. I can't imagine that the other creation moments are any more substantive. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.